Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. If you listen to podcast number four, how to systemize your business, I shared tips on systemizing your business. Well, I mentioned that I'd be interviewing some really interesting business leaders on systemizing organizations, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Hulk Talon, who is the CEO of the London School of English, which is actually now part of the London School Group. So before we bring in uh, Hog, I'd just like to say a little bit about the organisation. So the London School of English is the, actually the longest established accredited English language school in the world. So it's been established for over 100 years now and it's got premises in London and Canterbury and it's also offering courses online as well. So just a little bit about Hulk. He is actually, although born in the UK, he holds dual British and German nationalities, and he's lived abroad and travelled extensively in actually over 50 countries. His experience in dealing with sales and marketing, and also latterly in the education sector, spans up to 30 years now. And I'm absolutely delighted that he's joining us today to share with us some of his experience and hints and tips on his experience of ISO 9001 at the London School of English and how that's been rolled out across the group and also hopefully providing you with some guidance based on his experience along the way. Hello, Hug. Hello there. Hi. Uh, Thanks very much for joining us today. Before we begin, could you tell me a little bit about you that not many people would know? (laughs) Not many people would know. Right. Okay. Yes, I mean, perhaps the thing that, uh, well, you kind of inferred a little bit before, I, I've travelled quite a lot over many years, um, but actually not long after graduating, I found myself posted on a small Japanese island out in the Pacific Ocean for two years. It was, it was a fantastic, it was a life-changing experience, actually, and one that I'll remember to the end of my days. So what were you doing out there then, may I ask? Well, I was teaching English and perhaps a career choice after graduating simply because I couldn't quite decide what it was that I wanted to do. So I thought I'd kick off with that. You know, ironically enough, that's what I've ended up doing 20 odd years after I returned back home from Japan. But yeah, it was teaching English in the state school sector in Japan and being posted to about as remote an outpost as you can get in Japan, which was yeah, <laughs> an absolutely fantastic experience. Enjoyed every moment of it. Great. It's obviously stood you in good stead anyway for your role at the London School of English that you got at the moment. So the organisation has been established for over 100 years now. What do you think is the secret of the success of the organisation? I think quite simply, it's, it sounds a bit contrived perhaps, but you know, a genuine passion for what we do. And I think that it is fair to say that although profit's important, it, it's really a byproduct, if you like, of providing an outstanding service um, rather than being the primary driver of what we do. And when we communicate that view of the world and our business, that really attracts some really talented and motivated staff who really share those values. Mm. So I think that in turn, it, you know, if you like, it, it, it's a bit of a virtuous cycle because those people then also bring the challenge and help us to continue to develop and evolve and strive to be a, a better business. Because obviously, of course, it, it's a constant process. You can't just say, right, that's it. You know, we're successful and we stop here because what works today, as we all know, may not work tomorrow. Okay. I noticed on your website, which I was looking at earlier, that the London School of English have impressively been rated as excellent in over 750 independent client reviews. I think that was on Trustpilot. Mm, that's right. So for a business that might be looking to use independent reviews like that to validate high quality services or products, where would they begin by encouraging clients to leave these reviews and how would you make the most of them? Yeah, I mean, we've, you know, there are, there are a number of perfectly good platforms out there. But we happened to land on Trustpilot really and thought that, that was one that could work well for us. The starting point, I think, has to be that if we aspire to be rated excellent on a ratings platform, then I guess we'd better be excellent. And as long as you find a credible ratings platform, 
by which I mean one that can't really be manipulated. So we can't go around deleting comments just because we don't like them. Then there's nowhere to hide. Then I think that sends out a really strong signal about the confidence we have in our own services. So mm. yes, we chose Trustpilot in the end. And because I think a lot of people are familiar with TripAdvisor, and I don't know about you, but I really wouldn't book into a hotel for a holiday, you know, without having a quick look in there first, just to see how people mm-hmm. rate it. And, and I'm guessing people would, you know, certainly for a product like ours, it's a purchasing decision that, you know, takes a little bit of research around it first. You know, you want to get it right. So I think people will take the time to read those reviews. And it's really important, I think, to respond to those reviews. So anything that's less than five star does need a response. Even in the best of businesses, occasionally you get somebody who is dissatisfied. And I think it's being willing to accept that people have had a a point of view that might not be um, wholly positive as we might like, and being willing to address that in public, as it were, because as I said earlier, we've got absolutely nothing to hide there. And, you know, we are proud of our rating. We've got an average score of 9.6 out of 10, and that makes us, I think, currently globally the top rated language training provider. And that's something we should be justifiably proud of. Um, nevertheless, occasionally something pops up and it's less than five stars. And, you know, <laughs> we just take a good, careful look at that. And, and the fact is some people will just never give you a five star rating. And that's that. Yeah, it's inevitable, well, isn't it? Do you have a process in place then so that you review the reviews? Yes, I mean, they all come straight to, well, we have somebody in our digital marketing side who looks at those reviews. We have somebody on the team who responds to those reviews. But actually, as soon as a review is posted, it also comes straight into my inbox, pops up on my phone. And so I'm kind of getting almost a live feed of those reviews as they come in. And I have to say, it's nice to be able to scroll past all the five stars. But when a four or a three star Mm. review comes in, of course, you you really Mm. look very carefully at that one. But in some ways, the reviews that are lower than five stars, they're really quite important because I think people get suspicious. If if you've got a string of five star reviews, I think people smell a rat that may not actually be there. But they sort of think, hang on a minute, this Mm. this doesn't sound credible. You know, where's the bad reviews? And, and you know, to come back to that TripAdvisor example, if I'm booking a hotel that rates, I don't know, sort of (laughs) 9.2 or something, then I'll think, oh, that looks nice. Now let's have a look at the worst comments on there for (laughs) Um, um, I'm I'm (laughs) sure there's a similar process that goes on when people are trying to work out whether they go with us or not. Yes. So how do you encourage your clients to leave a review then? Is there an automatic process that once they've completed a course, then you send them an email or something so that they can provide a review? We do. We simply say, we'd love you to review us, please. And we're actually close now to a thousand reviews. That should happen, if not by the end of March, then early April, we should click into a thousand. And, you know, it's simply by virtue of asking that people are happy to, um, mm. to to leave a review for us. And it's great. You know, we don't have to push it very, very hard. So just putting that into context then, so do you know approximately how many courses you may run in a year? It's perhaps better, rather than talking about the number of courses, because some people do multiple courses, it's probably better to talk about the number of people who attend our courses every year. Uh, we have something like 2,000 mm. people who attend our courses every year. So very roughly, Mm. I would say that we get a 25% response rate to requests for reviews, which actually is at all. That is excellent, isn't it? Yes, yeah. But as you say, that's kind of driven by the process, though, that, you know, as soon as that course is finished, then there is that email, there is that communication with them to get feedback from them, which is obviously important if you want to retain them as a client and and hopefully welcome them back for the next course potentially or for them to pass on through word of mouth the experience that they've had. And and actually, these review sites, I mean, they're fantastic because, you know, we're the best world in the world and, you know, having been in sales and marketing for 20 years myself, you know, a a business can Mm -hmm. say all it wants about itself, but actually... It's really what other people say about your business that really matters. And it's the, it's that word of mouth. It, it's those reviews, those authentic reviews. They're the things that I think really heavily influence the purchasing decision. So you know, I think they're great because, you know, you can't hide. And let's face it, if you want to be a great business, you shouldn't need to hide. But we all occasionally might get something just a little bit wrong. 
and actually knowing that if you got something wrong and it's going to be front and center, you know, in the public gaze, it really focuses the mind in terms of either putting it right or not getting it wrong in the first place. Yes, that's right. I mean, because ISO 9001 is based on the Plan, Do, Check, mm-hmm. Act cycle, isn't it? That was initiated by Deming many years ago. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, obviously, nobody's perfect. No company's perfect. But all we can do is learn from that and build that into that yeah. continual improvement yeah. loop. So talking about continual improvement in processes, I was impressed to see quality uh, being at the core of your marketing material as well. So When I was on your website, I had a look uh, at your brochure that I downloaded. And right at the very beginning, in big, bold letters, was the statement, Our Proven Process. So that caught my eye immediately, uh, very process-driven myself. So that's right slap bang at the beginning of your company brochure, which does say a lot about the company. And I'm just going to praise a quote from that. It says that the time you spend with us is so much more than a course, accommodation, free lunches, and additional services. You will leave us having had an unforgettable experience. And then you provide the process for success. So you're not burying it away within a quality manual, are you? You are putting that straight at the front of your marketing material, which I think is really interesting. And again, I think this goes back to what you were saying earlier about, you know, you haven't got anything to hide. This is how we operate. This is who we are. You know, this is why we're successful. And this is why our clients have a great experience. How do you manage to continuously comply with that process if that is the proven process? Yeah, I think probably it's fair to say that it isn't really a case of managing to comply with the process. It's actually uh, because that kind of implies that it's almost a constant battle, a constant struggle to comply with the process. I think the fact is that the process is completely embedded and it's not, well, if you see the process and without going through, you know, trying to describe it here, it's not rocket science at all. And I think that it's probably the biggest challenge, if you like, is the process of baking it into our culture. That was perhaps the harder bit to say, this is how we approach the process. And I, and I hate to call it a process at one level, because this is all about people rather than machines. So the process is broad in the sense that it's got to be, it's got to have enough flexibility and adaptability in it as well. But actually, it's really important that everybody understands how we approach this. And again, coming back to the point that you were making earlier, you know, quality is such an overused term. There's barely a business out there that doesn't talk about the quality. And I think perhaps what the readers of all this marketing read there is, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Okay. Fine. So where's the evidence for this? And, you know, for us, the evidence is in something like our trust pilot scores that have to take ISO certification, for example, that we take that very, very seriously and that we actually do have a way of delivering that is repeatable. And that obviously, in some ways, is almost the definition of a process, isn't it? An effective process is something that you can repeat and expect to get the same outcome, Mm. Um, even if it is, it's not manufacturing widgets. This is actually delivering outcomes for for people with with varying needs. And actually, the fact that we put that process sort of up front and center, as it were, really, that doesn't matter in terms of our competitors, let's say. You know, I don't mind if our competitors see what our process is. The fact that they can read it doesn't necessarily mean that they can repeat it. You know, I think that that's a key point. It actually gives people a a sense of confidence, if you like, that they too can benefit from us having spent, let's face it, over a hundred years working with tens of tens of thousands of clients. And we know how to do this stuff and it'll work for them too. And it's really about, you know, reassuring them that this is how we'll approach it. When you're here, that this is how we approach it before you arrive with us. This is what we'll do when you're with us. Whatever your needs and expectations are, this is how we'll approach that. This is where we can be flexible. And this is what you can expect when you leave us. And people like to see that. It does give mm. them that confidence. Yes. And at the end of the day, it is about that experience, isn't it? Which if you're going to be looking for a language course, you're looking for language course. You're not necessarily looking for the experience, but it's the experience that you remember. It's the experience that you're impressed with. And it's that experience that makes you talk about it. So it's a talk trigger. Yeah, I think that is right. Um, You know, because we tell them that you'll have a great experience doesn't necessarily mean they'll leave it, but it's great when they leave with it. They're buying the process, if you like, but actually leaving with something else. 
So obviously your focus is on getting the right results for your clients. I was just wondering, as I was having a look at some case studies on the website, and I was quite inspired by some of the stories behind, you know, some of the experiences of the people that, as a result of going on one of your courses, that in some cases, they they could be quite life-changing. I was just wondering if you might be able to expand on an example. Um, Yeah, I mean, there are hundreds, happily. Perhaps one that we picked on for our most recent brochure, which you may have read about, was in fact a German lawyer working for quite a big law firm. And his English, frankly, was was really excellent. And perhaps that's one of the the points of confusion for people when they say, well, actually, my English is really quite good. And we'll say, well, you know, yes, we're sure it is in terms of being able to communicate effectively day to day. But in the context of your work, and and most of the work that we do is around professional language and culture training, but so just focusing on the language aspect of that for a minute, is are you as confident using your English in a work professional context as you are in a social context? And that's where the value lies. So coming back to this example of the German lawyer, he was definitely progressing through the ranks, as it were. And he said, I kind of hit a little bit of a buffer. All of the new roles that I might potentially be interested in would require me to be using English in the workplace, not just German, and be able to communicate you know, across not just different countries, but different cultures as well. And he just lacked the confidence that in a legal context, he'd be able to perform effectively. So he came to us for what is actually, to be fair, a rather unusually long course. He came with us for 12 weeks. I mean, a typical length of stay might be just two or three weeks. Some people just come for a week. He had a clear objective to say, I need to be so confident in my use of English in the workplace that, and I'm going to have to be able to evidence that, that when I get back to the office after this effectively sabbatical time that he's taken out to commit to this um, CPD, that I can go back into the workplace and uh, confidently start to apply for some of those new positions because I feel that I've now got the skills to be able to do this. And the, the fact is for many people, it's the opportunity cost of doing the course that is you know, the real financial consideration. It costs far more for them not to be at work than it costs them to come and do the course, if you follow me. But that's an Mm. example of somebody who went back and said, you know what, I've now got this whole new skill set and it's going to change my career path. You know, now I can do all sorts of things that I wouldn't have been able to do without this Mm. course. That opens up doors for people then, really. It gives them new opportunities then that may not have been able to access to in the past. That's right. Actually, there's an example of somebody who was very much sort of in in the middle of his career, a guy in his late 30s, early 40s. But actually, you know, perhaps Mm. at the front end of that scale, you get people who are just graduating and, you know, they're they're marketing themselves, if you want, out in the big bad world and trying to make sure that their CVs stand out above others. And that means also Mm. committing some time to getting the skill set that they need in order to be able to to perform effectively in, in a meeting situation, to be able to make great presentations in English, to be able to negotiate confidently in English have cultural awareness, um, you know, it's sort of preparing yourself for the workplace as well. So there are all sorts of reasons why people want to do these courses. But one thing they all have in common is that the vast majority of people who come to us, they want to progress. Mm. So the, the London School Group holds many different accreditations, including the British Council for Teaching of English in the UK. And clearly the organization is very successful. What made you choose to achieve certification to ISO 9001? And obviously, staying on the theme of systems as well, how did it help you to systemize what you do within the organization? We we actually wanted to build on some of the other areas that we've been looking at in terms of becoming more efficient in our business and almost trying to make sure that these different areas that we're focusing on also could hang together a bit more effectively. And we, we never sort of sought ISO certification just to get the badge, as it were. And it was an important point that I discussed with Rachel Blackwells, actually, when we first started exploring the certification route, because we really wanted to find a partner who could work with us to make us genuinely more efficient. And that was really our core driver. 
And we work with another system called the Entrepreneur Operating System, which is really sort of a, a, it's just a way of managing the business. And it's kind of splits into sort of six different components. And one of those components is processes. And I felt that the processes side of our business was frankly weak. And we really should strengthen that area in particular to make ourselves much more efficient. And so in many ways, it was really about looking for an approach that would help us to be become more systematic in our approach to, to managing those processes, documenting them so that, you know, good processes could be repeated. I think that the, mm -hmm. one of the main benefits really was to sort of implement some of those really important refinements to the way we manage the business, become more effective, become more efficient, adding value, um, not just for us who work in the business, but also for all stakeholders, you know, and ultimately, of course, for our clients who experience it. And, you know, if we've got a much more effective and efficient way of working, well, that will benefit our clients too. Yes, and that's clearly evident in the, in the feedback and the response that you've had from the reviews, isn't it? So in terms of that experience of implementing a quality management system, what would be the main thing that you said that you could take away from that? in terms of a learning experience for you? Because obviously you've worked for different organizations over the years and, you know, the organization is already successful, but obviously yep. with any business, there's always room for improvement. What would you say was the main thing that you learned from that experience of implementing Well, I think the first thing to say is that entering into a business that is already ISO certified and implementing the system are two very, very different things. Uh, I had previously worked in an organization that had mm. ISO certification and you just work along established practices and you're barely aware of it, actually. When you're trying to implement it, especially in the creative industries, you know, where perhaps structure, it doesn't come quite so natural as it might in other sectors. Um, there's definitely a challenge there. And it is, frankly, it's really easy to become overwhelmed by the whole thing. And frankly, I think if we try to self-implement that would have taken a whole lot longer. I think we'd have got ourselves tied up in knots. And so actually finding a partner that we could work with was quite a liberating experience, I have to say, because it helped us to see not just, you know, as, as I say, you can't sort of see the wood for the trees. And there's a real danger of that when you're trying to get so many areas working together that you really do lose yourself in amongst the weeds, as it were. So I think perhaps one lesson that we learned there was to say, well, if the business doesn't have somebody who is already experienced in implementing, and I underline the word implementing ISO, then I would strongly recommend that somebody actually gets professional help to implement a quality management system because it's quite an involved process and, you know, frankly, a bit of a scary process until somebody comes in and actually brings some perspective to it all. And then all of a sudden you can start to see the wood with the trees and you do actually start to say, ah, okay, I can see now how we can achieve this. So let's just have somebody break it down for us. So once you'd achieved that for the London School of English, you then decided to roll that out across the rest of the group. But how did you find that? Was that fairly straightforward because you already had that well, Blueprint, actually, it that, was that, that um, in, in the process of rolling out. So we didn't roll it out for the London School of English first and then roll it out for the rest of the group. We started rolling it out for the London School of English and we had a couple of other parts of our right. business, which were startups. And we felt that, oh, actually, let's just do it for the main part of the business first and then roll it out for those other parts. And does that make sense? So first of all, a practical yeah, perspective, yeah. Is saying, well, like, okay, does that make sense? Wouldn't it be more efficient to do mm -hmm. it at group level? But then perhaps having got as far as we had rolling it out for that mm -hmm. core part of the business, the London School of English part, with all its complexities, because it is the lion's share of the group, we suddenly realized actually 90% of the job is done with this part of the business. So we may as well actually look at what we've done for that part <laughs> of the business and include the other parts as well. And so that was a relatively straightforward process to adapt what we'd learned for the first bit and, and roll it out for the rest of it. Excellent. So finally, what top tip would you give to somebody who's embarking on this journey to uh, well, implement just, a quality said, management uh, system? You know, a little bit earlier, I think the main thing is uh, if you don't have somebody who's already had the experience of implementing it, not just experience of, of using it, but or being part of it, but somebody who's got experience of implementing it, then go out and seek professional help to support you through that process because 
you know, it saves time. I mean, frankly, it, you know, we'd have somebody come in and they would work with us and we'd have a bit of a reset and say, yeah, okay, we know where we're going and then get back into it and sometimes lose our way a little bit. And then having that person come back in again, it's like switching the lights back on. Help you to stay focused. You think that momentum going having, until this assessment day. Yeah, activity yeah. And it all feels great. And then you're trying to get all your documentation in order. And I think it's also for the team as a whole, sometimes easy to lose sight of the overall objective here because they get bogged down in a lot of the detail. And that can be quite frustrating. So when you then get somebody to come back in and say, actually, mm. let's just refocus here. It's really not that bad. Let us just take a more holistic view of what we're trying to achieve here and how the bit that you're working on fits into the whole that all of a sudden people are motivated again and they get it again. And then it's also not just, okay, we are now technically compliant and we tick the boxes, but the challenge also is, well, the commitment. It's less of a challenge, more of a commitment than to say, actually, let's embed this into our culture because do you know what? It's quite hard work to constantly try and stay compliant. It, it is a process in itself, even once, once you are ISO certified, it's easy for things to fall off the radar a little bit. And we just have to remind ourselves when we have our reviews, are we still okay here? And if not, let's get ourselves back on track. So actually, from our perspective, not only did we use Blackmores in this case to help us implement the system and get ourselves to ISO certification, but to have Rachel coming back to us on a regular basis to just make sure that we are, um, we're still achieving everything that we can achieve within the system. And that's really, really helpful. Mm, good. Okay. Oh, thank you so much for sharing all Pleasure. of that information with us, Halkwe. That's been really useful. I'd just okay. like to part with a, a couple of final questions, not related to ISO standards. If you could gift a book to somebody, well, one what would that I've it read be quite mind? recently, it, it's kind of it is shop related, <laughs> and it's a book called The Culture Map by uh, <laughs> an American author called Erin Meyer, and. Uh, even though mm -hmm. I'm in the trade, as it were, in the sense of we do offer cross-cultural training and you know, you know, what we do is to help people communicate across borders and cultures. Um, but nevertheless, reading her book really helps mm -hmm. to everybody to develop insights into different cultural perspectives. And, you know, especially with all the stuff that's going on in the world at the moment, you know, it, it sounds like a big thing to say, you know, to sort of foster greater understanding and respect. And perhaps those are overused phrases to some extent. But actually, ultimately, if people understand where different cultures are coming from, then actually it makes it so much easier to communicate with them. And very often when things go wrong, it's because of misunderstandings. You know, reading mm. that book, you have so many eureka moments that come out of it. God, I never thought of it from that perspective. And that is sort of mind expanding at one level. You know, it, it's a really, really great read. Yeah, it's always good to be, you know, to look yeah, at things yeah. from different perspectives, isn't it? I think that can be so refreshing. Lovely. Just to end then, so what is your favourite quote that you'd like to leave listeners I with think today? That my favourite quote has to be one that I use both at work and actually with my kids, I've, I've got two children, one of whom is a teenager, and um, it's actually a Chinese proverb, <laughs> and that is, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the next best time is now. Oh, interesting. Very good. Oh, thank you very much for leaving that with us. So if our listeners would like to find out a little bit more about the London School Group, where do they go to to find out more information? Just go on to londonschool.com, londonschool, one word, dot com, and it, it's all in there. Okay, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time today. You've been a great guest. I really, well, really you. enjoyed our conversation. Uh, so thank you very much for that. So hopefully you took away with you some really interesting hints and tips on systemizing your organization and also a little bit about some of the, the benefits of doing client reviews and just focusing on that customer experience, not just the product or the service, it's the whole customer experience. We had some really insightful hints and tips there. So thanks once again for listening and I look forward to catching you on the next ISO show.